Professor Unger, how are you? I'm great, it's so nice to see you. You too, you're a Seattle native, right? That's right. How does the Bay Area hold up? Well, in Seattle, the high temperature is 55, the low temperature is 55, and the forecast is rain. In the Bay Area, you have beautiful, warm, dry weather, a million things to do, and it's a gorgeous place. What are you doing when you aren't teaching? When I'm not teaching, I'm often doing research and a lot of writing. But I, I love to attend uh, sporting events, and I, um, I love to snorkel. What's your favorite book? My favorite book, that's a tough one to pick, but my favorite book is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Favorite movie? Reds. If you had your own late night talk show and you could interview anyone, alive or dead, who would be your first guest? My first guest would be Robert La Follette, the great progressive senator from Wisconsin. I've been studying this man for more than 40 years, but there's still so much I'd like to know. I'd love to talk with him. What's the most embarrassing fashion trend you took part in? Well, there have been many, but I would say that the uh, green newsboy cap that I wore all through sixth grade was, was a real low. If you could go to college in any other decade, which one would you choose? I think I would choose like the 2050s or the 2060s, just to see what's new, what's changed in higher education. Do you have a go-to karaoke song? Uh, by popular demand, I don't do karaoke. What must you always have in your briefcase? I have a little yellow pad that has my to-do list on it. Okay, I was wondering, why do we have a special women's history class? Shouldn't that just be normal history? Well, now that's a great question. Why don't you come on in? We'll talk about it. We have a lot of um, specialized courses. We have political history, economic history. But if you take a general US history course, nobody says, oh, we're not gonna cover politics because that's in a specialized course. And we have lots of specialized courses. And the idea is, you know, you drill down on those, but still they need to be incorporated into the larger uh, um, uh, classes, not ghettoized as separate sort of less important subjects. One of my frustrations is often they're included in kind of sidelights in the history textbooks and so forth. Women's history in the United States represents more than half the population. That this is not some little specialized field, this is American history. And to not know women's history is to not know American history. Over the years, I've taught a lot of different things, but in recent years, I teach primarily women's history, um, and gay and lesbian history, and then the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, which is from the late 1800s through about 1920. One of the reasons I love teaching LGBTQ history is nobody ever says, oh God, gay and lesbian history again. You know, it's something that um, most students have not had before. I would also say there's some individuals that I think we really need to know about, and some are, specific to the advances in gay and lesbian history. But some, like Bayard Rustin, um, was you know top aide to Martin Luther King and really gave him some of his, his best ideas and sort of coached him on nonviolence and so forth, uh, was crucial in the creation of the, um, you know, the, the enormous protest in which Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Um, Bayard Rustin was you know, well known to be a gay man and was very, very active in that movement. What drew you to the Progressive Era? I have loved the Progressive Era since I was in graduate school. And it's just become, I've become more passionate about it because it's the period when the United States went from being this rural, sleepy nation to an urban industrial giant. And there were so many things happening at that time. Mass immigration, huge influx of technology that are happening today. So to me, history is a really practical tool. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era is not just interesting in and of itself, it's really almost like a blueprint for many of the issues that we're dealing with today. Another favorite memory was, I still have it, a note that a student sent to me. She was an older student. Apparently she had been very um, apprehensive about coming back. And she said, you were just so impatient with that. She said, you just believed in me so strongly that I kind of had no choice but to believe in myself. And I, I really, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to, to do that. It, it meant a lot to me that, uh, that, she, that she appreciated that and, and it made a difference. What do you hope students will take away from your classes? I hope that students will come away from my classes saying, oh wow, this has really helped me to understand my own life. Things that I thought were just sort of, you know, personal issues or whatever, I now see 
that you know I am certainly part of my my own historical context. I think that in some ways that could really be infuriating, um, but in, on the other hand, it can be really liberating. And I'm really hoping that that's what students will take away from, from my class. Not just the skills of you know, careful analytic thinking and reading and writing, but really a way of using the past to understand their own lives um, and, and therefore to make you know, positive change for the future. That's really exciting to me. That's when I feel like I've really been doing my job. Thank you so much for answering my questions. But now I gotta go run to meet my friends for a study session in the library. That's important stuff to do. Oh, wait. I actually have one more question. Sure. What advice would you give yourself freshman year of college? I would say go to every single class and then relax. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy this amazing experience. It, it only comes once in a lifetime. You're so right. I'll see you in class. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.